Are your ears ringing like mine? That happens whenever I get into some really deep water, like we did in the last lesson. But I'm ready to dive back in, so I hope you've recharged your tanks. Today, we're hunting for electrons. During this lesson, you will describe the location of the electron using quantum numbers, electron distribution, and orbital notation. The last time we talked, we discussed the fact that scientists really can't pinpoint an electron in an atom. They can just predict where it probably will be. We saw that a dartboard can help us understand this concept. The holes in the dartboard don't tell us about the order in which the holes were made or where the next dart will land. They just help us determine the probability of where the next dart will land. Remember that the word orbital has been chosen to describe the region of space around the nucleus in which an electron is most likely to be found. The orbital doesn't tell us where the electron was or will be next but it does describe the probability that the electron will be at a particular distance and direction from the nucleus. Today, we're going to discuss ways to describe an electron's orbital using quantum numbers. So, just what are these quantum numbers? To describe an electron in an atom, four quantum numbers are needed. N, L, M, and S. Don't be confused because we're calling the quantum numbers by four letters. For example, we learned earlier that the letter C represents a constant, the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. In the same way, these letters M, L, M, and S simply represent the four quantum numbers found in Schrodinger's equation. Letters are often used in equations to represent variables. Each electron within an atom can be described by its own unique set of these four quantum numbers. As we go through this lesson, it's important to remember that no two electrons in an atom can have the exact same set of four quantum numbers. Bear with me. We'll see why later. Let's begin our discussion of the four quantum numbers by starting with N, the principal quantum number. Energy level is a number. And remember that just as you can't stand between the rungs of a ladder, electrons can't be between energy levels. Electrons must be in one energy level or another, just like you must stand on one rung of a ladder or another. The principal quantum number, n, represents the energy level in which we find an electron. So, n's values are whole numbers beginning with 1. If n is 1, that means that the electron is in the first energy level closest to the nucleus. If n is 2, that means that the electron is in the second energy level. If n is 3, that means that the electron is in the third energy level, and so on. The larger the value of n, the farther away from the nucleus the electron is. Additionally, the larger the value of n, and the farther away from the nucleus the electron is, the higher the energy of the electron. The maximum number of electrons that could be in a particular energy level is calculated using the formula 2n squared. Make sure to write this formula down. You'll need it when you do your practice problems later. Let's go to the classroom to see if our students are getting the hang of this. Let's see if our students know how many electrons can be in the fifth main energy level. Watch as our first student tries to solve the problem. One hundred? No, that's not right. This student squared the product of 2 multiplied by 5 instead of simply squaring 5, then multiplying by 2. What about our second student? 10? No, that's not the correct answer either. This student forgot to square n before multiplying by 2. Let's hope our third student could answer our question. 50? Wonderful! 2 times 5 squared is equal to 2 times 25, which is 50. 50 electrons can be in the fifth main energy level. This isn't too tough, is it? Just be sure to do the math correctly. It looks like I should have my math hat on for this lesson, doesn't it? 
Hey there, Math Hat. So far, we've learned that of the four quantum numbers used to describe an electron in an atom, the first, n, represents the electron's main energy level. It is called the principal quantum number. And we've learned to use n to determine the maximum number of electrons in that main energy level. I want you to try this example and see how you do. How many electrons can be in the seventh main energy level? If you answered 98, you're right. 2 times 7 squared is equal to 2 times 49, which is 98. You must be wearing your math hat, too. Now, just what does the second quantum number tell us? The second quantum number, represented by the letter L, describes the orbital shape within an energy level. And just as we used n to determine the maximum number of electrons in a main energy level by using the formula 2n squared, we can also use n to determine the number of orbital shapes in a main energy level. Want to know how many orbital shapes a main energy level has? It's easy. The number of orbital shapes for each main energy level is the same as the principal quantum number for that level. In other words, the number of orbital shapes in an energy level equals the value of n, the principal quantum number. Here's an example. There is one orbital shape in the first main energy level because the principal quantum number for the first main energy level is 1. There are two orbital shapes in the second main energy level because the principal quantum number for the second main energy level is 2. How many orbital shapes are there in the fourth main energy level? Let's ask our students. Can these students calculate the number of orbital shapes in the fourth main energy level? Let's give them just a little time. Terrific! All students are correct. There are four orbital shapes in the fourth main energy level. We've said that there are different orbital shapes within a main energy level. Let's find out more. The orbital shapes we've been referring to are named S, P, D, and F. S is the lowest energy orbital shape within a main energy level, and F is the highest energy orbital shape within a main energy level. Remember, not all main energy levels have all of these orbital shapes. Energy level 1 only has one orbital shape, S. Energy level 2 has two orbital shapes, S and P. Energy level 3 has three orbital shapes, S, P, and D. Do you see the trend here? What orbital shapes would energy level 4 have? If you said S, P, D, and F, you're right. Each successive level merely has one more orbital shape than the one before it. Let's keep going. We already know the method to calculate how many electrons each main energy level can hold. We simply use the formula 2n squared. And we know how many orbital shapes are present within the various main energy levels. But what do we know about how the electrons in the main energy level are distributed among the orbitals? The first rule is this. An orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, provided they have opposite spins. One orbital, or a group of orbitals within an energy level that have the same shape, is called a sublevel. Calculation has shown that an S sublevel is comprised of one orbital, and so may contain a maximum of two electrons. A P sublevel is comprised of three P orbitals. Therefore, a P sublevel may contain a maximum of six electrons, two in each of the three orbitals. A D sublevel is comprised of five D orbitals and may contain two electrons per orbital, or a maximum of ten electrons. And an F sublevel is comprised of seven orbitals and may contain 14 electrons, again, with a maximum of two electrons per orbital. We'll use this information when we start distributing electrons in just a bit. But first, let's review what we've learned so far today. Your local teacher will stop the tape to give you time to copy the provided chart into your notebook.
We've learned how useful charts can be as we try to organize data. Watch as Mary fills in the chart reviewing what we've learned so far about main energy levels, sublevels, and orbitals. The first column represents the main energy level, N. The next column of our table represents the orbital shapes present in each main energy level. These comprise sublevels within the main energy level. Level 1 has only one orbital shape, and that is S. Level 2 has two orbital shapes, S and P. Level 3 has three orbital shapes, S, P, and D. And level 4 has four orbital shapes, S, P, D, and F. The third column we're to fill out is for the number of orbitals per sublevel. There is only one S orbital in each S sublevel. There are three P orbitals in each P sublevel. There are five D orbitals in each D sublevel. And there are seven F orbitals in an F sublevel. Remember that an orbital or a group of orbitals within an energy level that have the same shape is called a sublevel. Now, for our next column. Since each orbital can contain two electrons, provided that one spins clockwise and the other counterclockwise, the maximum number of electrons in an S sublevel is two. The maximum number of electrons in a P sublevel is six. The maximum number of electrons in a D sublevel is ten. And the maximum number of electrons possible in an F sublevel is 14. Remember that the number of electrons per main energy level is equal to 2n squared. So, energy level 1 has a maximum of 2 electrons. Energy level 2 has a maximum of 8 electrons. Energy level 3 has a maximum of 18 electrons. And energy level 4 has a maximum of 32 electrons. Adding up the electrons present in the sublevels of each main energy level would give us the same thing. Good job, Mary. Now for the third and fourth quantum numbers. The third quantum number, m, describes the orientation of the orbital in space. In other words, imagine three-dimensional space, and this quantum number describes where the orbital lies, along the x, Y or Z axis. Although we won't study this quantum number here, it's good for you to know that it exists and that it is a further description of an electron's location. A fourth quantum number, S, describes the motion of an electron within an orbital. Remember we said that an orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons provided they have opposite spins? Well, this quantum number tells us if an electron within an orbital is spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. So, where are we? We know that quantum numbers are used to describe an electron's most probable location in an atom. And although there are four quantum numbers, represented by the letters N, L, M, and S, in this course, we're most concerned with N, the principal quantum number that represents the main energy level of the electron, and L, the quantum number representing the orbital shape or sublevel within the main energy level. I think we're ready now to do some electron distributions and orbital notations. Just like all of nature, electrons and atoms assume arrangements that have the lowest possible energies. When we study the driving forces of reactions later this year, you'll learn that a tendency toward lower energy is a law of nature. When electrons assume the lowest possible energy arrangement, we call this an atom's ground state. We learned about the ground state and the excited state in an earlier lesson. Using quantum numbers and a new rule called the diagonal rule, we can determine an atom's ground state configuration. First, let's learn about the diagonal rule by exploring parking. Let's say you're entering a multi-level parking lot and you have two goals in mind. First of all, you want to conserve gas, and secondly, you're interested in the ease of parking. When you get to the first level, 
there are two parking spots available, and both of them are slanted, like in most parking lots. Wow, lucky you! Not only are these spaces on the first level, so certainly gas can be conserved, but they're also very easy to enter. Now, if both of those spots are filled, you have no choice but to use a little more gas and go to the second level. Here you find two slanted parking spaces, and unlike the first level, there are also six spots that are perpendicular to the wall. Although not as easy to pull into as a slanted space, these perpendicular spots are still not that hard to access. So, you would take one of the two slanted spots if available, but if both of these were filled, you would go ahead and pull into a perpendicular spot. But what if you reach the second level of our parking garage and all of those spots are occupied? You have no choice. You must use more gas at this point and move into the third level of our garage. Here you again find two slanted spots and six perpendicular spots, but in addition there are ten of the dreaded parallel spots. It goes without saying that you would first choose one of the slanted spots, and if both were full, you would then choose one of the six perpendicular spots. But if all of these are full, and you were to stay on this level of our garage, your only choice is, oh no, one of the ten dreaded parallel spots. Now you know that one of your goals is to use the least amount of gas possible, but you're also interested in the ease of parking. So instead of trying to park in one of the available but dreaded parallel spots, you opt instead to use a little more gas and go to the fourth level. There you again find two slanted spots, six perpendicular spots, ten of the dreaded parallel spots, but there's even a new twist on the fourth level. Fourteen of the most frightful parking spots you could ever imagine. At that point, you're glad that a slanted space is available and that you decided to choose the fourth level slanted spot over the third level parallel spot, even though more gas was required to get to the fourth level. Everyone knows that the amount of gas required to go up one more level is well worth the ease of parking in a slanted spot as opposed to a dreaded parallel spot. Well, this is a little like the way electrons assume their ground state configuration. Remembering our parking garage analogy, let's look at what's referred to as the diagonal rule and see how this helps us determine the ground state electron configuration of an atom. Your local teacher will pause the tape now to give you time to copy the diagonal rule into your notebook. It sure would be easy if electrons simply filled the first energy level, then the second, then the third, and so on. But remember our parking garage? A slanted space just might be worth going to the next level if it can keep you from having to enter the dreaded parallel space. To determine an atom's ground state electron configuration, you'll start at the bold dot and follow the diagonal to the arrowhead, filling the sublevels with electrons. Then you'll move to the next diagonal, following it to the arrowhead, and so on and so on and so on until all of the atom's electrons have been placed. Let's do an example so that we can see exactly how this diagonal rule works. What if we wanted to know the electron distribution of hydrogen? An element's electron distribution tells us how the electrons in an atom are distributed within the energy levels and sublevels. Some textbooks refer to this as an electron configuration. First of all, when hydrogen is located on the periodic table, we see that it has an atomic number of 1. We've already learned that the atomic number tells us not only the number of protons a specific element's atom has, but because the atom is neutral, it also tells us the number of electrons an atom has. So hydrogen has one electron. If we follow the diagonal rule, we see that we always start with the lowest energy sublevel, which is 1s. Now the chart we filled out with Mary will really come in handy. Look at the fourth column titled, Number of Electrons in Sublevel. You see that S sublevels can hold a maximum of two electrons, because S sublevels are composed of only one orbital. Since hydrogen only has one electron, the one S sublevel has plenty of room. We write one S, then use the superscript of one to represent the one electron in that sublevel. This electron distribution of hydrogen is red, one S one. 
What would be the electron configuration of lithium, which has an atomic number of three? Well, according to the diagonal rule, we first start with the 1s sublevel, which can hold two of the three lithium electrons. We still have one more electron to place, so using our diagonal rule, we see that the next sublevel to fill is the 2s sublevel. Although this sublevel can hold a maximum of two electrons, there's only one lithium electron left to place in the sublevel. We read lithium's electron distribution as 1s2, 2s1. Let's see how our students are doing. Mary is using the diagonal rule to determine the electron distribution for sodium, which according to the periodic table, has an atomic number of 11 and consequently has 11 electrons. Following the diagonal rule, Mary first places two of the 11 electrons in the 1s sublevel and then two electrons in the 2s sublevel for a total of four electrons. She knows that a maximum of two electrons can be in an s sublevel. Mary still has seven more electrons to place. Using the diagonal rule, she sees that the next sublevel to fill is the 2p sublevel. The p sublevels can hold up to six electrons, so she writes 2p6. By adding the superscripts, she sees that she has placed 10 of sodium's 11 electrons. So the remaining electron, according to the diagonal rule, will go into the 3s sublevel. Sodium's electron distribution is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. When Mary checks her work, she adds the superscripts together to make sure that the sum is the same as sodium's atomic number. Now it's your turn. The atomic number of nitrogen is seven. So using your diagonal rule, write the electron distribution for nitrogen. Here's the correct answer. 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. When we add the superscripts, we get seven, which is the number of electrons a nitrogen atom has. Are you doing okay with this? Your local teacher will have lots of practice for you after this program. Remember, practice makes perfect. We only have one more topic in this lesson to cover, and that's orbital notations. Once we have the atom's electron distribution, orbital notations are a piece of cake. Mm, this is yummy. Let's do the orbital notation of hydrogen. In orbital notations, we draw circles to represent the orbitals present. We already know that hydrogen's electron distribution is 1s1. Since the s sublevel only has one orbital, we'll draw one circle to represent the orbital. Arrows represent the two electrons that can be in an orbital as long as they have opposite spins. One arrow pointing up and one arrow pointing down represent the opposite spins. Since there's only one electron in the 1s orbital for hydrogen, we only draw one arrow going up. What about the orbital notation of nitrogen? We just did the electron distribution for nitrogen and found it to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Using the electron distribution, we draw circles representing the orbitals in each sublevel. There's one 1s orbital, one 2s orbitals, and three 2p orbitals. Now use arrows to represent the electrons in each orbital. Remember to draw the first arrow pointing up to represent the clockwise spin of an electron, and the second arrow in an orbital pointing down to represent the opposite or counterclockwise spin of the second electron. We've used our diagonal rule. Now it's time for Hund's rule. Did you notice that in the 2p orbital, the electrons first entered an empty orbital before beginning to pair up in the orbitals? Well, let's face it, wouldn't you want your own room too? Seriously, this is known as Hund's rule which states that orbitals of equal energy are each occupied by one electron before any orbital is occupied by a second electron. In other words, when doing orbital notations, 
place one arrow or electron in each orbital within the sublevel before placing a second arrow or electron in an orbital of that sublevel. Earlier in the program today, I told you that you would find out why no two electrons in an atom can have the exact same set of quantum numbers. Well, are you ready? Yeah! This is your answer as to why no two electrons in an atom can have the exact same four quantum numbers. Even if the two electrons are in the same orbital, in the same sublevel, and in the same main energy level, their spins must be opposite. The first three quantum numbers, which represent a particular orbital in a particular energy level, can be identical. But the fourth quantum number, the one representing the spin of the electron, would have to be different. This is exactly what the Pauli exclusion principle states. No two electrons in the same atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. So now you know. Oh. Boy, do we get into some deep stuff or what? Quantum numbers, electron distributions, orbital notations. Oh, my, my head is swimming. Oh, that's right. I really have been swimming. Whew, that's a relief. Well, I'm ready for the chemistry quiz. How about you? I hope you do well. <laughs>